Our next speaker this morning, Dr. Heather Hudson, has a very distinguished career. She's the faculty animal geneticist in the Department of Animal Science at Cornell University. Her primary research focus uses genetic profiles to identify ancestral and population dynamics and establish their relationship to performance or, adap or adaptation. Her work has identified genetic markers associated with athletic performance in Alaskan sled dogs and production or adaptation measures in livestock. She teaches both the animal genetics and applied dairy cattle genetics courses at Cornell University. And today, she's going to be talking about managing small gene pools and examining the Alaskan sled dog and its unique DNA performance markers. Please welcome Dr. Hudson. Hi, folks. I want to say, can everyone hear me? Because I tend to kind of walk a little bit. <laughs> I always feel way too short standing behind podiums. But uh, I really appreciate everyone having me here to talk to you today. I have had a great time getting to know folks here. Uh, such a diverse group, and I think that's made the talks that we've had fantastic. So Patty had originally contacted me and asked me to talk about sled dogs, which I can talk forever about <laughs> sled dogs. Um, but then the more that we talked and discussed classes and other research I'm doing, she asked me to put a little bit in about managing small gene pools as well. But to get a background, and I think, you know, I'm a typical researcher, so I'm always looking for different projects, is, and oh, the more you talk, the more I'm like, I wanna do that, and I wanna do this. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of background about myself so you know where I'm coming from. Oh, darn. Okay, all right, I will. Okay, well, I think this is all right. We'll go with this, I'll try to stay put. Okay, so a little bit about myself. I'm from the East Coast, and I grew up racing sled dogs. So I started racing with my family when I was seven years old. I did my undergraduate at Cornell in animal science, but I was much more towards animal nutrition, and I just kept racing dogs and moving further north. So I moved from Pennsylvania to New York, up to Vermont, and of course, this moved on with I needed a real job to support my hobby. So I was a veterinary technician, and I did a lot with exotic animals and small animals. And if you run dogs and you're competitive, you will eventually end up in Alaska. I love Alaska. Um, other than my kids and dogs, it's probably the third thing that I talk about. Um, so I moved to Alaska. An awesome job where I started teaching genetics. So I worked as a lab technician doing genetics research on wildlife and sled dogs. And I went to all these villages and worked with the local villagers, the high school students, and subsistence animals on genetics projects. Eventually, I wanted to decide my own fate in research, so I decided to quit my awesome job and become a student. What was I thinking? <laughs> um, <laughs> but I survived. Uh, but a lot of this research took me away from Alaska and back to the East Coast. So I went to Maryland and lived in West Virginia. I did a lot of my sled dog research at the National Institutes of Health in the Human Genome Institute. Um, and then I kind of jumped ship after my PhD. I love dogs, but you know what? There's not a lot of jobs for a dog geneticist. So I decided, hey, we are not gonna stop eating cows anytime in the near future. And really, dairy cattlemen have the gold market on genetic selection for their animals. So I went to the USDA to learn about livestock. Oh, and on top of the cattle stuff, uh, my bosses decided I was probably the only one crazy enough, because I came from Alaska, that they could send me over to Africa and work on goats. So when I was at the USDA, I did a whole bunch of work with dairy cattle as well as African goats. And eventually, this has led me to my current job, back up at Cornell, so full circle, uh, as faculty now. And so my primary position at Cornell is the dairy cattle geneticist. But there's a mantra in my lab, focus. We have a hard time focusing some days. So we do dairy cattle. Uh, I, I feel like this is my bread and butter. You know, this is really, we work on mastitis, we work on lameness, a lot of disease issues for animal health and welfare. But we still work on African goats. And I love Alaska. We work on muskox. Um, and one of my students talked me into doing sheep, so now we do sheep. 
and hey, I will never stop doing sled dogs, so I still do sled dogs. And my most recent thing is I'm now running the Raptor Center. So hence, I can sympathize and uh, understand lots of the folks that are here. I don't do reptiles yet. Granted, some of my students have tried to convince me of this. So, so yes, very diverse background, and this has really helped me in my research. I used to walk on cattle and tell them about dogs. Now I come to things where there's a lot of dog folks and I tell you about cows. <laughs> so to bring us back to why I'm here and what I'm gonna talk to you today, you'd be surprised at how similar it is when you look at population genetics, performance, and disease. How similar are dogs and livestock? I worked really hard to find these pictures. <laughs> So there really is a lot of similarity, whether I'm looking at differences in breeds or performance versus production, a lot of the approaches and the technology are the same. So with this in mind, today I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about genetic diseases and breeding strategies, and that comes back to how do you manage those small gene pools? And then I'm gonna tell you about sled dogs. And uh, that's both the research that we've already done as well as current research that we have going. So why are genetics important? So for a lot of dog breeders or pet owners, really when they think about genetics, and the more we get to know, you think about, well, it's important because we have these diseases. And how do we fix these diseases? How do we breed our dogs to fix these diseases? So usually that's one of the big topics of why is genetics important? Don't worry, do not try to read this. This is supposed to be impact though. Roughly, there are at least 159 reported genetic diseases in dogs. Okay, that makes that whole slide of why is genetics important a lot more monumental. We have a lot of genetic problems in just dogs when we think about it. If you break this down to a dog breed, I happen to take the German Shepherd. This is one where it's broken down and you can see the ones that are most relevant within the German Shepherd, other ones that are high prevalence in German Shepherd, and other potential ones that are occasionally found. So that's just one breed. So all breeds have varying degrees of genetic problems. Um, and it's not that we're bad breeders, it's just that these things come up. They're spontaneous, they're inherited. We need to work with them and manage them. Roughly, I do cattle and I do dogs, and there's a huge difference in genetic testing that's available for these different species, as well as what people pay for them. So this is one of my soapbox moments, because as a dog breeder, heck yeah, I would go out and test for these things. I'm gonna get in trouble with industry some days when I say this, but the downside or the difference is a dairy cattle farmer will pay maybe 40 to 50 bucks. Not everyone's gonna do this, but many progressive dairy cattle farmers are gonna pay $40, $50 for a genetic test for their cattle. That's gonna tell them their cattle's milk production potential, how much fat, how much protein, what's their reproductive potential, what's their potential for mastitis, what is the confirmation of that cow in one test? 40 to 50 bucks. How many of you test your dogs and what is the average price of those tests? And, Per test. So I'm going to rile you up here, but know as the consumer, talk to your veterinarians, talk to the people that are supplying these tests. It's possible. The technology is possible. Okay? So I'm putting that out there. I'm going to get all kinds of like tomatoes thrown at me someday, but it's possible. Okay. But now we go on to what's kind of the biology? What are the factors that affect genetic diseases? So some of this are spontaneous mutations. Other times they're inherited mutations. You can have a spontaneous mutation in one generation that's then going to be inherited in future generations. Okay, so that's some background there. There's different types of mutations. You have mutations that are SNPs. That's a single nucleotide. That's one base pair that changes but it can mess up the whole protein and down the road what phenotype or trait you see. You can have insertions, deletions, you can have copy number variations, all kinds of mutations. You can have different genetic diseases, so they can be a whole chromosome that's changed or missing. It can be your mitochondria, 
It could be Mendelian, simple inheritance. We love th those. Um, but then it can get more complicated. Polygenic means there's multiple genes regulating a trait. And then you want to get it even more confusing. You have complex traits, so not only do you have multiple genes, but now we add in the environment and how that messes things up. So there's lots of different ways that we have genetic diseases and how those diseases are controlled by the genes. Then we go back and we look at how are they inherited. So that's really the part that I'm going to talk to you today about shortly, as well as phenotypic severity, trait severity, always comes into play when we talk about diseases. If you have a trait that, yes, it affects your animal, but it only mildly affects it, are you going to worry too much? If you have a trait that is severe, it's fatal, how much are you going to worry? How are you going to try to get that out of your population? That makes a big difference in how you manage the genetics of that particular trait. So particularly when we talk about inheritance, because this is the part I want to focus on for a few minutes, because it's really what we're talking about when we think of breeding strategies. So when we think of inheritance, you can go backwards, which is great coming up with uh, Dr. Shipman's talk. You can go backwards and you look, can look at ancestry. Where did that trait come from? What's the ancestry of that breed or that individual dog? Or you can look forward. What are we going to do with our dog moving forward? What are the breeding strategies or mating strategies that we'll implement? Okay, let's start with the backwards part first. Dog domestication. This is great building on Dr. Shipman's presentation. So ancestry. How did we get that first dog? Or how do we go on and create new breeds of dogs? So we can have all of these different pro or ideas of we're going to breed this to get this trait, we're going to bring in this particular individual to get another trait, but really we have that breed origin. Okay, we have a breed, now we want to refine that breed. We really want this particular coat color. We want this particular size. So we have that breed refinement. And then we go on, we have our breed origin, we have our breed refinement, now let's manage that breed, because as you go on, things are going to happen. Mutations are going to come up, those spontaneous mutations. They're going to come up, they're going to become more prevalent. How do you manage those traits? Okay, so one idea for managing traits, one breed strategy, and this is a lot has to do with that original breed development, is the idea of crossbreeding or outcrossing. So if you really look at, a lot of times these are used interchangeably, but if you kind of look at the slight differentiation between crossbreeding and outcrossing, usually the difference is crossbreeding. You're taking a dog from one breed, you're crossing it to a dog from another breed. Whether that's dogs, cattle, sheep, that's the idea. You are crossing two breeds. Now outcrossing, a lot of times that refers to more of your breeding strategy within a breed. You have a dog that's within the same breed, but it's kind of one ancestral parent lineage. And you breed that out to a dog within the same breed, but it's of another parental lineage. So you're outcrossing. Each of these increases heterozygosity hybrid vigor. Yesterday we were talking about our crowd, our audience is heterogeneous. We're different, we're diverse. That's what that heterozygous is, it's different. And in the long run, this decreases the likelihood of getting any genetic diseases because we're very diverse, okay? Okay, now looking at the opposite strategy, line breeding or back crossing. How many folks, and this is not a bad thing, how many folks, if you breed animals of any species, line breed or back cross? We did? Absolutely. You're selecting for specific traits. This is how you promote breed uniformity and trait selection. So this is what we have done for millions of years. The whole domestication idea is surrounded on this concept of selection. So this is not a bad thing, but it does have consequences that aren't always good. So you're selecting for your desired trait, but unfortunately when you do that, you're increasing homozygosity, that sameness, and that homozygosity puts together your one potentially bad gene 
with another bad gene, and now you might be affected. So you increase the likelihood of these genetic diseases when you're selecting and backcrossing in inbreeding when you do this. So the bottom line is when you're line breeding, when you're backcrossing, you are increasing the frequency of the desired trait. But sometimes, often, you are increasing the frequency of possibility of genetic diseases. The two different graphs that are up here, figure out which one my pointer is. There you go. These two different graphs, both of these are examples of backcrossing and line breeding. The difference is the degree of inbreeding you would have in this particular in, or in this individual versus this individual. So in this case, really individual A is the one that we are back crossing or line breeding. It's carrying the traits that we want. In this scenario on the right, you are going to have a much higher degree of inbreeding in individual G because you have bred that individual A every single generation. Whereas over here, again, you're probably selecting for a particular trait that individual A is carrying, but you're breeding its offspring, and then eventually you might back cross back into individual A again. So yes, you're increasing that selection for the trait that individual is carrying, but you have a lower degree of inbreeding in this individual I than you do in individual G. So this is just something to be aware of. When you're selecting for traits, know that yes, you might be bringing across or bringing down these deleterious traits as well. Watch for them, make note of them, and don't be shy about them. Bring it out because you know what? If you've done it, other people have probably done it. And other people are trying to get rid of it. <laughs> but if you work together, you have a much higher chance of correcting that particular trait. All right. So this brings us back to the idea of small gene pools and how do you manage those small gene pools. And a lot of times people think of this in the concept of our natural environment, our wildlife species. Cheetahs are a fantastic example for small gene pools. And what does this have to do? I personally work on Alaskan musk ox. I could spend ha this whole lecture talk to you about the fascinating evolution of the musk ox who were hanging out with the woolly mammoth and they're still here. But think in terms of your dogs or your cats. We still have uh, the same concept of small gene pools. So it can be very different for different breeds. And we have all kinds of things that have also caused bottlenecks. Wars are one of the biggest issues that cause bottlenecks in our dog breeds. But with that in mind, keep in mind, what are you going to do about trait selection given the gene pool of your breed? And is that trait selected for fashion or function? And even if it is fashion, is it at least a functioning animal? Okay, we have disease carriers. But what's the severity of that disease? Okay, if it's a fatal disease, you are not going to breed that animal, hopefully. But if it's a less severe disease, maybe that particular dog carries a lot of fantastic traits, but he's also the carrier for some particular eye disorder or something else. That doesn't mean that you have to take him completely out of the gene pool, but this is your choice. You could remove that animal from the gene pool, but depending upon the severity and the consequences, weigh the factors, you can also leave them in the gene pool. Don't breed them to another carrier, okay? This is how you can keep that animal's positive aspects in the gene pool, but still diminish the negative gene that it's carried within the entire gene pool, okay? And then lastly, okay, no one has tomatoes in the audience. I'm gonna hide if you do. Okay, so the last one I put in here is the potential for outcrossing. Is that an option? So I grew up in dogs. I, granted, I ran mixed breed dogs, but I am very well aware of breed purity. Um, and then I went to dairy cattle and I started doing these population studies and, and the folks were teaching me and they're like, oh yeah, I've got a Holstein, but really if you breed it out, and then as long as you breed it back to, you know, to like 15 sixteenths dairy cattle or Holstein, it's purebred again. It was like, what? <laughs> I'm like, what is wrong with you? You can't do that. Um, 
<laughs> and it totally messes up some of my genetic stuff, trust me. But, you know, that's totally different philosophies. I know that is not commonly accepted in dog breeds. But I have honestly had a few folks from different breeds come up and say, we feel like our breed is in trouble. It has too many genetic diseases. We don't think we can honestly manage this within our breed. We're considering outcrossing. We don't want to do it willy-nilly, though. We would like to know genetically what are the best breeds. We know historically what breeds developed this one. Genetically, how do you support that so we can make the best decision to outcross, get that hybrid vigor, and yet keep that breed uniformity and go back to this is a purebred dog. So not everyone is on board with that strategy. I don't think they've done it yet. Granted, some people, you know, quietly do that, and we never admit that. But I'm putting that out there. You know, it's an idea. And it's, I, I would like you to open your minds, think positively. It's not the answer for everything, but sometimes it might be the best answer for the health of that animal. So is that an option? All right. That is my kind of my educational, I think, spiel. Um, and now we're going to go on to my fun, nerdy research side. And we're going to look at what has genomics taught me about sled dogs and how can I combine the background knowledge I have on sled dogs with this genomic technology. So yes, I am deeply passionate about sled dogs. I grew up racing sled dogs. We were talking about Doc Lombard yesterday. There's Doc Lombard up on the front of the How magazine. I would be the second or the slightly taller of the two ki kids. That's my little sister in front. Um, yes, that's me. I started with Siberian Huskies, which many, many folks do. Uh, my family eventually switched over to Alaskan sled dogs, which I'll tell you all about here in a second. And that's me in the lower left-hand corner. I just look bigger. You know, I put lots of clothes on in the winter um, <laughs> up in Fairbanks. So the first thing is, what's an Alaskan sled dog? Not an Alaskan Malamute, not a Siberian Husky. What's an Alaskan sled dog? It's not this. <laughs> I love some of these movies. I have these movies for my kids, but this is not an Alaskan sled dog. Instead, Alaskan sled dogs were really this mixed breed dog of this northern ancestry. And we'll talk about that, but they've been bred for their athletic performance. They're used for transportation. They're used for companionship and protection. But we eventually have the advent of snowmobiles, airplanes. We don't need sled dogs anymore. So really in the 1930s, mushers that had dogs started transitioning to a sporting dog. They're going to use these dogs to race. We're going to compete, uh, pit our ability to train the dogs over your ability to train the dogs. And who has the best dog team? And the competitiveness over the years has really changed in the fact that we have awesome nutrition, we have great health care, we have all of these, you know, fantastic lightweight equipment, don't hit a tree. Um, but it comes down to the fact now of, okay, who has the best dog genetics and who can train the best dogs? So that's a big deal. And even though they're not purebred dogs, we keep really good records, pedigree records on our dogs, so we can use that. And on the right-hand side, I have some pictures of Leonard Seppala. So Leonard Seppala was really one of the first in the U.S. that helped develop the Siberian Husky, at least in the U.S., to what we know as the current AKC registered Siberian Husky. Do his dogs look like your current Siberian Huskies? Think about how this breed has evolved over the years. All right, so going back to what's the ancestry of an Alaskan sled dog? Well, we said it has that northern ancestry. So I know from history, growing up racing dogs, that yes, they bred Siberians in it. They were developing at the same time as the Alaskan sled dogs. So we're Alaskan Malamutes, as well as what we commonly refer to as the Inuit, even though it's not an official breed. Um, other people would accept it as a breed. It's just not registered breed. But other dogs that have been bred into the sled dog, sled dog people don't care about what they look like other than are they functional? Can they compete and do their job? So we will mix anything we think of that's gonna make that dog better. That includes greyhounds, pointers, English pointers, salukis, borzois, collies, do name it and lots of things have been in there. 
Okay, so here's a big thing. Who's heard of the Iditarod, Yukon Quest? Most folks. Okay, who's heard of the Open North American? I know one fellow. Oh, a couple. I'm impressed. There are two racing styles, big racing styles in sled dogs. There's distance, more like a marathon, and there's sprint, which is more like track and field. So up in the upper right-hand corner, that's a lot of the differences in how far do we run. Huge difference, 30 miles at most to 1,000 miles. Um, how fast do we run? How heavy are our sleds? How many dogs are in our team? The bottom line is we've selected dogs for these two groups for their endurance or their speed. It's not that sprint dogs don't have endurance. They still got to run 30 miles. But within sled dogs, they're the speed demons. And vice versa, the distance dogs are the endurance dogs. So in a lot of my research, I compare these two broadly generalized groups. So my objective in my sled dog research is really looking at how do genetics relate to all of this population and this ancestry that I know about sled dogs? What's really in a sled dog? So what's not only the ancestry, but how does that difference in breed influence their performance? And then, okay, the bottom line, what genes regulate their athletic performance? What make them these amazing athletes? So this is, a, don't worry, I won't get into details here. But in general, the data set that I'm working with, some of the work that I'm doing when I look at ancestry, I started with comparing sled dogs to over 122 different breeds of dogs. And a lot of the data that I have, I have anywhere from 96 microsatellite markers, which is kind of when I started my PhD, um, to now I use generally around 170 to 130,000 SNPs. These are single nucleotide markers, but these are 130,000 markers across the genome. So we've got a lot of information on these dogs to look at population, to look at genes, to look at traits. So with that in mind, what does this data tell me? So this is the part where, okay, I totally turn into a nerd. I love what I do, especially when I'm doing it on sled dogs. So one of the first things that happens is genetics reflect the racing style of sled dogs. Okay, I am obligated to show you these bar graphs. This is what geneticists do sometimes. So each one of these vertical lines or these vertical bars is an individual dog. And I have genotyped with these 130,000 markers every one of my dogs. I have about 45 sprint dogs and 45 distance dogs from multiple kennels. And I pick kennels that are top winning kennels in either distance or sprint. Okay, so this is kind of what I'm starting with. Now on the genetic side, I'm looking for patterns. And then I got to put on my detective hat and decide, well, what do those patterns mean? So that's the part that I'm saying, here's my genetics. I found these different patterns. What are those patterns associated with? So the first thing I find is that my patterns are fairly related, not perfect, but they're fairly related to whether they're classified as a distance dog or they're classified as a sprint dog. So that's the first thing. But you can see some of these sprint dogs have the same genetic pattern as distance dogs. Okay, that's interesting. Uh-oh, Houston, we have a problem. Uh-oh, middle button, middle button. I totally did something. Whew. Man, I was panicked there for a minute. All right, so do genetics separate sprint from distance on most dogs? But then they go on and I start looking, what, what's the next thing that I see? So now I have a whole bunch of different patterns, each different color of these lines represents a different genetic pattern. Okay, so what does this represent? What do I know about my population? Well, I can tell you that over here, I'm just looking at distance dogs. These patterns are relative to what kennel I sampled the dog from. Okay, now when I did this, if, if you're trying to be a good geneticist and setting up a good program, um, you're not necessarily gonna put you know full siblings in a population study, not like this. You're gonna try to pick your less related dogs. So even though these dogs come from the same kennel, these dogs are unrelated within at least three generations, okay? But regardless, my patterns show me that these dogs have a common, uh, common association with the kennel of origin. 
But then I have, you know, outliers. You always have outliers. And any science that doesn't ever have an outlier, I seriously wonder what they've done. So here, I look at this kennel. Okay, this is all one kennel, but you can see there's, there's this dog that carries a particular uh, pattern here that is the same pattern that's over here in this kennel. Okay, so I go back to the kennel owner and I'm like, hey, tell me about this dog. And he's telling me about the performance. It's a great dog. He said, where'd you get it from? He's like, oh, I bought it from that guy. <laughs> oh, <laughs> gotcha. All right. Okay, so, so really, I have these different patterns that are associated with the kennel of origin in distance dogs. Sprint dogs. Yeah, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> I went, okay, sprint dogs did not necessarily associate with the kennel of origin that they came from. The bottom line is I still was able to find unique patterns in sprint dogs. And both the distance dogs and the sprint dogs, I could trace those patterns back to popular sires or dams. If I went back far enough, there were popular sires and dams. But I kind of said, well, wh what's really the difference? And actually it was more, I think, a difference in culture in these racing styles. Distance drivers get a really good dog and they hide it. It's my good dog and no one else can have it. <laughs> Sprint mushers, they get a good dog. They're like, hey, you pay me the right price, you can breed to this dog. Um, and, and you know, it comes around one way or the other. Uh, both systems work, they're both competitive, but it's different philosophies. And so you could really see the bottom line is each of these different populations went back to common sires and dams, but it was a difference in breeding management amongst the drivers. You know, do they keep their breeding strategies within kennel or do they go across kennels? So that's what the difference was, but it was kind of fun to see that in genetics. Um, oh, the other really cool one, I love this one as well, is, okay, you see this dog over, they have some of this gray, denoted in gray, but they have a per certain uh, pattern over here. And there are the same pattern over here in Sprint. So I found that really intriguing that some of these dogs had the same pattern as some of the Sprint dogs. But this guy is a distance musher. Anyone guess what distance musher had the most winning team in all the distance races in the three years that I sampled sled dogs? That musher. This particular distance driver won more distance races, Yukon Quest, Iditarod, in the three years that I sampled. Hence, he had the fastest distance team out of all the ones that I sampled. And I thought that was really interesting that his were the dogs that had similar genetics to many of these fast sprint dogs. So they were, he was incorporating those, that something to do with speed and yet keeping the endurance as well. Okay, that's, that's the end of my population stuff. It's very exciting. Um, <laughs> but we go on. What else do we know about sled dogs? I told you I wanted to know what's the ancestry of these dogs. We've, you know, it's been this melting pot of dogs to make these fast northern dogs. Um, and, and I wanted to know what's still in a sled dog. So what's the foundation of sled dogs? I originally did these 96 microsatellite markers. Who has heard or seen those tests where you send your mutt's DNA sample in and you figure out what breed it is? This was some of the early tests leading up to that. I tried some of those early, early dog breed tests and went, okay, doesn't always work. They've come a long way. I will say my personal opinion when people ask me about those breed tests, if your dog is within a first or second, maybe third generation hybrid, those tests are pretty good. If they're like, they've been being crossed for generations, they're gonna be kind of tough. And, and sometimes they do come up with really hilarious stuff. You'll see up here, if you can like get a magnifying glass, I'm gonna show you one. Lassa Opsas are in sled dogs. <laughs> no one will admit to the Lassa in their sled dog. But that goes back to these breed developments. Lassas came from a similar ancestral origin as Malamutes and Siberian Huskies, okay? So I go on. All dog breeds have unique genetic signatures. There's patterns we can relate. That's how they do this purebred test. So I'm gonna do this in sled dogs. 
And the first thing that happens is kind of monumental because most dog breeds that have these signatures, yes, our dog breeds were often developed for a particular working task or maybe our small companion animals, but still much is currently on their appearance. We have standards. They should be this size, this shape, this hair coat, this color. Sled dogs, not so much. And yet sled dogs have their own distinct genetic pattern. So they are a genetic breed. So that was the first big finding of this ancestry. Well, they're their own genetic breed. But you can go in and still pick up signatures of those purebred dogs that kind of came in and influenced sled dogs. So yes, there are signatures of Lhasa in sled dogs. <laughs> Um, yeah, my sled dog folks went, what are you doing? But the things to kind of take home from this are the ideas of what make them similar and what make them different. So all of those dogs you saw on the previous slides, now I've taken all the sprint dogs and I've put them together and I said, what's average for sprint dog and what's average for different distance dogs? So this big blue bar in both groups, that's that sled dog signature that's unique to them. So for the most part, they're sled dog, but that's not everything that makes them up. They also have Siberian Husky and Alaskan Malamute signatures. It's not that they, Alaskan sled dog mushers are currently mixing in Siberians and Malamutes, but from an ancestry standpoint, this is part of their foundation, okay? So in general, both groups have Siberian and Malamute. Distance dogs have more of that genetic signature whereas sprint dogs have more of the sled dog signature, and they also have more of these other working and athletic dogs, so particularly pointers, borzois, salukis. So that's kind of some of the difference as well as similarities. Okay, that's what's in a sled dog. What's it have to do with performance? Well, what's more important when I think of performance? Is it more important to have the borzois signature or the pointer signature? What makes them fast? You know, that's kind of the questions I was asking. So what are the optimal breed components? So what I did with this is I took sprint dogs and I took the best sprint dogs that had the best speed and I compared them to my other sprint dogs that had the lowest speed. Okay, so this is how I did this. I'm looking within each group, within sprint, within distance. W compare the good ones versus the bad ones for that trait. So that Alaskan sled dog signature that makes them unique, well, that's really important to being a sled dog. That makes a sprint dog have higher speed, faster speed. It has better endurance and work ethic. That is my polite way of saying, do they pull? <laughs> yes, they do. So that sled dog signature increases with all of the really high performing sprint dogs. But distance dogs, it's a great thing for speed and it's a great thing for work ethic. It's not so good for endurance. So the next thing that comes up, what makes a better endurance dog for the distance dogs? Well, in distance dogs, that ancestry of the Siberian and Alaskan Malamute is actually found to a higher degree in the distance dogs that have better endurance. They're the ones that are making the entire Iditarod and Yukon quest multiple years, okay? So these are all things I'm like, okay, this makes sense. I got this. Um, and then, of course, you know, it's science, and you always end up with these, th these things, and you're like, where the heck did that come from? Who knows what an Anatolian shepherd is? <laughs> you did way better than me. I did not. Um, and so I, I get this signature of Anatolian shepherd in distance dogs. And again, well, at least I think sled dog mushers would admit to an Anatolian shepherd before they'd ever admit to a Lhasa. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I went back, you know, and I did some research. I'm like, okay, where do these dogs come from? Because in the distance dogs that showed improved work ethic, I was finding more of this signature. And, uh, and, and I just love the description. So personality-wise, so you've got to remember, work ethic, this is really behavioral. Do they want to pull or not? So I look up uh, Anatolian Shepherds, so a few similarities. They are honestly were originated in Turkey and in, you know, snow climates, but they are a flock guard dog. 
So this isn't like, you know, we aren't running here a bunch other than we're protecting our flock. Um, but yes, so northern climate, that's a similarity. Um, but then it was the behavioral stuff that just made me chuckle. Because yes, I grew up, I started with Siberian Huskies. Um, I've been around Alaskan Malamutes. Um, I've been around sled dogs. And you read about the Anatolian Shepherd, and you know, some of it is, you know, they're very stoic, they're hardworking. All of these are great traits, in my opinion. Um, stoic, hardworking, tough, hardy, that type of thing. And really, to me, this all boiled down to, yeah, they're all stubborn dogs. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I found that truly interesting. It was a way that genetics brought out something I never would have come up with, and I thought it was really interesting to see those similarities. All right, so then we take this on, and I'm, I'm still, now I've looked at what's ancestry. How does the ancestry affect performance? Okay, now let's go directly to performance. So in the big picture, I'm working on all of these different traits. I'm still chasing these different traits. Um, I'm going to give you one example of what we found in heat tolerance for sled dogs. So in this particular example, again, I took heat tolerant sled dogs, not really bulldogs, and those that are not heat tolerant, not really pugs. But I'm looking within sled dogs and the ones that are tolerant to heat and the ones that are not. Yes, sled dogs must face global warming as well. I genotype these dogs. And then I analyze that data just like I did before, but in this case, I'm looking for genetic patterns related to heat tolerance or not so tolerant. And the bottom line is I find different genetic patterns. So what I was able to do is I have haplotypes. Haplotypes are just a set of markers that are inherited together. It's a pattern, this is the pattern. So in this case, we have this particular pattern that's found in sled dogs that show superior heat tolerance and this pattern that's not so good. So in the long run, if I wanna help out my dog mushers and genotype their dogs, I can now tell them, your dog carries two of these, awesome. Your dog carries one of these, be careful. Your dog carries two of these, be really careful, okay? Uh, but yeah, you know, I just did all of that work on ancestry. How does that relate to heat tolerance? Well, guess what? German short hair pointers, carry this pattern. And if I look at my sled dogs, well, in the sled dogs, all of a sudden at this area where this pattern is, it jumps, there's a spike in the ancestry. So basically they're carrying the same pattern as these German short hair pointers. So it's not like I can come back and say, absolutely positively, all sled dogs got this gene from pointers, but that is one idea that I can say it is very likely that many sprint dogs who we can trace back to having pointer ancestry have inherited and as breeders, we have selected this trait for heat tolerance and it has probably remained in the sled dog now coming from that pointer ancestry. Okay, so that's how we can tie in not only the trait but also the ancestry and how that has influenced sled dogs. All right, so this brings me up to research that a lot of that research I've just told you about was things that I did through my PhD and uh, years. Now I have students, my army of students, that help do lots of work. Uh, this is Alex Valenti, one of my students who just graduated last year. And he worked on this idea of what we call signatures of selection. So we're, we're kind of thinking very big picture and how do we look at selection in the genome in these different groups of dogs? So what Alex really focused on was this idea of runs of homozygosity. Don't worry, this is your only real biology slide here. But a run of homozygosity, remember, any of us individuals, we get one set of our uh, genes from mom, one set from dad. This area highlighted in yellow is a homozygous area. It's a run of homozygous. So what that means is we inherited the same pattern from dad as we did mom this whole area, it's the exact same from mom and dad, okay? So that's a run of homozygosity. And really what we wanted to do is this shows us regions where we've selected our dogs from. Remember I was talking about genetic diseases? This is also what can lead to those genetic diseases, having that increased homozygosity. So it's both good and it can be bad, but it's a way that we can look for selection. So we basically took all of our sled dogs and said, where are these runs of homozygosity? 
Where are they the same? Like here in this box, we have a similar run exactly the same in this dog as we do down in this dog. But this third dog doesn't carry that. So we're looking at where are dogs similar and where are they different? That's what we did in this particular analysis. I say we. I was the advisor. I said, hey, do this, and he is awesome, and he did that. Um, so the first thing that we did was we compared uh, purebred dogs to Alaskan sled dogs. So I said, I don't care if they're distance or sprint, they're Alaskan sled dogs, and I'm going to compare them to these ancestral breeds, the Siberian, the Malamute, the Pointer. I'm going to compare them, and I want to know where are they the same and where are they different. And this is where I do the happy dance. I think this is freaking awesome because I, I've been chasing this athletic performance for years, and I get things that go genes that are related to these biological pathways, metabolic processes, fatty acid metabolism, respiratory uh, chain, um, precursors to metabolites for energy. I am so happy. I'm like, Alex is looking at me like I am a total freak, and I'm like, oh, it's awesome, it's working. Um, but yes, it's great, lipid metabolism. So this is what we get comparing sled dogs to other ancestral breeds. Okay, so we take it a step further, and we compare sprint versus distance. So to me, I'm thinking this is speed versus endurance. And again, I narrow that down, and I say, what's the biological significance? And I'm doing the happy dance again. All of these same things, but then I even get more. I get things like locomotion and blood circulation, muscle contraction. Yes, we have athletic performance. Um, so currently, Alex, I couldn't let him go. He graduated. I hired him. Um, <laughs> he's still in my lab. So now we're kind of at the next step of trying to look at these individual genes related to these pathways and say, what are the actual mutations that are changing this different phenotype, the best dogs versus the not so good dogs? So that's where we're at now. Um, in the long run, I'm thinking sled dogs, but really I'm passionate about all working dogs. And this is applicable to all dogs, all cattle, sheep, you name it, for selection. So thinking about, we have now done studies on adult dogs knowing their capabilities, ranking them, and looking at their genetics. This gives us information about population. Genetics influences nutrition, health, performance, all of these traits. And the idea is, in the future, when you have these markers related to the traits, okay, now you look at the genetics of your puppy. And just like they do in dairy cattle, we can give an estimation of that puppy's potential for these traits. So in the long run, you would have genetic selection that's hopefully more accurate. It takes less time to select for those traits for these working dogs. So that's kind of my big picture, long range goal. We do it in dairy cattle all the time. We do it in beef cattle. They're starting to do it in sheep. We're thinking about it in goats. I'd like to see it happen for dogs. All right, only a few more slides here. Just telling you what we're doing at the moment. Um, because I have an army of students that I adore. Um, even when I drive them crazy, they drive me crazy. They're like my kids. They're just my big kids versus my little kids. Um, one of my students, Tyler, he's working on an actual disease trait. Uh, in sled dogs, we commonly call it wheezers. So this is laryngeal paralysis or laryngeal collapse. Other breeds have this, but most commonly, it affects them in older age. In sled dogs, they are born with it congenital. So we see this at a very early age. It has varying degrees of severity. Some dogs, it's so bad they're put down. Other dogs, it's mild enough that they can compensate for it. So regardless, this is basically this wheezing that you hear. That's why we call it wheezers, because their larynx is collapsing and they can't get enough of oxygen. Um, we do know it's heritable. We haven't quite figured out the pattern of inheritance. It's not a very simple, you know, dominant or recessive. Um, but yes, it's, it's coming along. We have all these, these dogs. I'm working with a number of veterinarians. Um, this is one of these cases where it was a situation just like this conference. I was talking to the uh, International Sled Dog Veterinary Association about all of that other research I just showed you. 
And I had veterinarians come up and go, we have this problem, it's called Weezers. And I had vaguely heard about it. And they're like, can you help us with the genetics? And we found some funding. The veterinarians were the ones that diagnosed the dogs, so we worked together. And that's how Tyler ended up with this project. And I was really skeptical because we don't have many dogs in the project at all. Um, but really what we want to do is the goal is to find the marker that's related to this disease, hopefully one that's causing it, but at least one that's highly associated to it, so that mushers can test their dogs. Um, so that's the goal, and we've done this in a few other diseases. I didn't show the information here, but we've worked on color blindness in sled dogs that's also seen in Siberians. Um, and carried, we found it, it's seen in Alaskan Malamutes, we found carriers in Siberian Huskies. Um, we've also worked on Alaskan Husky encephalopathy. So we have tests for both of those now in sled dogs, and that's the goal for Tyler's project. Um, and really, it's coming along well with a very small sample set of only 48 dogs, which really had me concerned from a statistical standpoint. Um, it's coming along better than I expected, and we hope to have more information. Right now, we're refining it to figure out, can we find a causative marker? So that's where that is. We're looking good. Tyler's working hard. I'm the slave driver. <laughs> um, another one that we're working on is specifically within the Siberian Husky breed. Uh, so I did all of this ancestry stuff, and this has led to, well, what about selection within Siberian Huskies? So similar to Alex's project where he did that runs of homozygosity, the idea is to do something similar, but looking within the Siberian Husky. And the idea here is that Carolyn, my student, she's really looking at these patterns based on how are Siberian Huskies used. Okay, I grew up racing sled dogs, and like I said, we started racing Siberian Huskies. But I can tell you that a Siberian Husky that's used strictly for racing versus the ones that are in shows, there's a lot of difference there, okay? So I'm curious, can I pick up that difference genetically? So that's what Carolyn's working on. And you can see she's out. I take my students out. We've been uh, in a very exciting way. We got funding this past year to do a lot more dog sampling. Um, we've been to Michigan sampling dogs. We, I took three students and my daughter to Alaska in August. Um, we've done over 200 dogs in about the past two months. And it was a fantastic trip, taking them all to these different places, seeing all these kennels. They worked their tails off, including me. Um, but we had a great time. So Carolyn's comparing both physical body measurements in Siberian Huskies, as well as, you know, the end goal is to look at genetic signatures. She's done a little bit of this in about 48, I think 40-some Siberian Huskies. And we have some preliminary results. They're not significant yet. We need more dogs. Um, but she's kind of compared the pet dog versus the non-pet dog. Um, and we're finding interesting differences. And these aren't, don't get afraid. This isn't saying one group is better or worse. It's saying that there's differences that have to do with these biological pathways. Okay, so that's where we are. Um, I'm putting a plug in for my own research. We're looking for more Siberian Huskies. So we have a reasonable amount of strictly racing Siberian Huskies. We have a reasonable amount of show Siberian Huskies. We also have a good group of dogs that are used for show and hobby racing. We are lacking the pet Siberian Husky. So I want the sofa dog. I want the ones that aren't necessarily bred for show, but the ones that the average guy has that he loves his Siberian Husky. And we want to see, can we find those genetic differences that make the sporting Siberian Husky that's used for that versus the ones for show versus our couch potato, lovable. They're all lovable, but those different groups. So anyone that has any contacts, particularly, I'd look at all the groups, but I really need the couch potatoes. Okay. Um, and this was actually us up in Alaska. We were in Denali. We had to, you know, do a couple side things there. Um, and yes, we need couch potatoes, please. And lastly, one of our other projects that's coming down the pipeline. Anyone here heard of Balto? Balto is a famous sled dog. Um, 
There's lots of famous sled dogs, but he's the most well-known one. Kids' books are there, movies are about Balto, uh, within the Iditarod, that type of thing. And I had another veterinarian along with some museum curators in Cleveland go, hey, we have Balto. What's Balto's DNA compared to modern sled dog DNA? And well, I got a monopoly on this one. I'm the only one that has modern sled dog DNA. Um, so, so yeah, we're looking at taking some ancient DNA, um, granted not nearly as ancient as you were talking about, but they are from preserved hides, basically, and trying to extract DNA from these famous sled dogs and say, how have our modern sled dogs evolved? What, how are they the same? How are they different? So, yeah, this one's more of a fun one, but it's like, I get to play with Balto. <laughs> Um, so that's one of the other ones coming down the pipeline. Uh, lastly, bringing all of this together, both my beginning talk about small gene pulls as well as the research that you saw, I think a huge thing to kind of bring all of this together is thinking about industry. And when I say industry, I'm talking about you as the pet owner, you as the breeder, you as the pet food company, any of those things, industry as a whole versus research where I am. So we really need to have communication here. From industry, what are your needs? What are your concerns? A lot of this work you saw on sled dogs, it's my passion. It's what I did. But on the other hand, I'm from that industry. So I know what sled dog people care about. I don't necessarily know what the dachshund breeder cares about, okay? So I think that communication is super important. You know, how, what's important to the industry and then thinking about it scientifically, how can we address that? Okay, now we have kind of a two-way streak to follow that up. What, um, how do I support the research objectives? Okay, I, I found what is important to you, and I'm thinking about it, but now how am I gonna do it? And that goes back to industry. You know, getting uh, funding opportunities and directives. You know, these are our priorities, and I'm not saying you have to, as an industry, support all of the research I do, but you have to be there to help, okay? Both in these are our goals, as well as we're gonna back up our goals now. And then lastly, okay, it's back on my shoulders as a researcher. Okay, I'm gonna do something about it. I'm a nerd, it's all exciting, but how am I gonna get it back to you to use it? So I'm a very applied researcher. I come from dairy genetics as well now, so trust me, it must be applied. Um, but I think about this when it comes to dogs as well, or wildlife. So I'm gonna do my research. How can the industry apply that research? Okay, I come up with a brainstorm. I'm working with industry. I need industry's help to get it out there so everyone can use it. So I think this is kinda, this is my wrap up. There needs to be this communication. This is a great group that shows such a diverse group uh, and communication is really facilitated here. So kind of spread the word. <laughs> you know, there needs to be that continual communication. All right, I have a great group, whether they're at my lab or where I came from, um, as well as in this case, lots of sled dog kennels that I uh, owe lots of thanks to. Um, so yes, this is where I've come from and I'm happy to answer any questions. And if you didn't like the talk, I at least have really cool pictures. <laughs> Just before you start asking questions, which I'm happy to answer, I've got a little bit of time. I've got to scoot out right after this to catch my flight because I have little kids and tomorrow I put on my dairy cattle hat and start doing dairy talks. Um, but if anyone needs, I've got cards here. You're welcome to email me and Patty knows how to get a hold of me as well. That was a great talk, thanks. I left Morrison Hall 40 years ago. It's really <laughs> nice to see some good Everyone has gone here. through Morrison Hall. <laughs> Um, so you didn't mention epigenetics, and I'm wondering how the, the experience, the racing experience of the dogs might influence changes in uh, subsequent uh, generations. Oh, you're, you're just going right to the heart of, let's just jump head first into epigenetics. <laughs> so epigenetics is really this idea of having the environment influence how genes are expressed. Um, and yeah, it's really hard. <laughs> 
So a lot of the work that I've done, we haven't specifically dealt with epigenetics in this group yet. We're looking at a lot of the dynamics between this trait versus that trait. We haven't gotten to the epigenetic standpoint, but you know, it, I've, I've really struggled with the idea of I've tried to select top performing kennels that feed similar diets. They run similar races. So I'm trying to control for some of those environmental factors in my studies to make them similar. Uh, it's by no means foolproof, not even close. Um, but we really haven't gotten into the epigenetics, but I think you know that's a really exciting way the genetics is going. You didn't comment on something that I'd urge everyone who's at, ever been interested, go to the Iditarod headquarters because they always have a musher on site. I was privileged to meet Remingtons, the father and son that are now alive. He, they're the, the son and grandson of Remington, who really was very influential in publicizing the Iditarod. Comment on the change of the weight of the sled and the infusion of new blood. So do you mean the change of the weight in the sled between kind of like throughout the race, or are you thinking of the difference in that weight between sprint and distance racing? Both. Um, what I'm getting at is the Remingtons were discussing with a judge who happens to breed Salukis, and we were all there together. And he said, and I'll quote, my sled is much lighter now. He's an Iditarod, so distance. My sled is much lighter, and this is 15 years ago. I am thinking of including either Borzoi or Salukis in my uh, pack. What would you, as a, a sprint dog, recommend? And they got into a long discussion. To me, that was industry and change of mechanics. Mm -hmm. impacting the dogs. the dogs. Yep, so yeah, our technology has really gone to, you know, we have these high-end sleds in, in sprint racing, our sleds, the really competitive ones, they weigh like 14 pounds. Don't hit a tree, <laughs> do not hit a tree. The ones in distance racing, you know, they're heavier, but it's still, they've done the same things. They're lightening their sleds, they're lightening their loads. They're still carrying them the same required materials for health and safety. And in some ways it's really good because they've lightened their loads, they can actually carry more safety and health equipment. So in that way, it's kind of nice. But yeah, the dogs have really changed with adding in, you know, I was very curious for years, everyone's tried to breed in greyhounds. And yet those first generation greyhounds, you just, you don't really see it stay. And a few people have bred in the Borzois and the Salukis, and there's more leeway in sprint dogs. So you see more of that genetic signature of these unique breeds. And I think it's because they're still running 30 miles, but yet it's, it's not easier, it's different. We can put a dog coat on a sprint dog and it's enough to get it through 30 miles. It's not enough to get it through a thousand miles. So the distance mushers are still more restricted they have to still have a big furry dog. You know, they can't have the small Saluki pointer hair coat on their dog. Um, but on the other hand, further down the generation, they can get little tidbits of those Salukis and Borzois that remain in the distance dogs as well. Um, so it is, it is impacting and it's changing the dogs. And that's part of the thing that I think we're curious in just, I mean, it's not a huge evolutionary distance between Balto and modern sled dogs. You know, what, that's 70, 80 years. But yet I think it's gonna be really interesting just to see the difference in that time period because Balto probably didn't have no Saluki and Borzoi in him. Um, but yet ancestrally, we might still pick up some of those same traits. Uh, just a comment uh, with regard to the 159 problem areas of uh, breeding and the uh, production and line, line breeding and back crossing of the production of those 
problems. That's always been the way of identifying where your problem areas are in the absence of DNA marker identification. And so the bad news is, yes, you do do that, but the good news is, yes, you know where not to go with your breeding program. Mm -hmm. And I would always kind of couch that uh, yeah. remark in those terms so that we don't get stabbed by people who pick up on that. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I really want to encourage breeders that it, it does depend on the actual disease and severity, but there's a lot of good genetics, and, and I come into this a lot more when I'm talking to a dairy farmer with the idea of, okay, their animal carries, you know, such and such a gene that's not necessarily a horrible gene, but it might not be the best gene, but that is their best milk-producing cow. And, and I'm like, well, you don't have to get rid of that cow, and you can actually continue to breed that cow. Just don't breed her to another carrier. Um, so that's my personal opinion and how I would encourage some of those traits that, you know, you can still reduce it in your breed population and keep the really good traits. That whole genetic engineering thing might come down the road as well and be really helpful, but that depends on industry and acceptance. Well, thank you. Fascinating talk. And just so ironic that, you know, you see, uh, I can see how much effort and energy and passion you put into improving a particular breed or breeds and individual members of that breed, and yet at the same time, you know, out in the wider uh, country, most, uh, most dogs, I think, today are mixed breeds or grossly mixed, and many of them come to me sterilized. I'm a practicing veterinarian, and so my question really is, is uh, Clinical veterinary medicine depends so much on the problem-oriented medical record format, and it always starts with signaling. And so with purebred dogs, you know, you, you have do dove very deeply into what signalment is, particular breed, particular line, and yet uh, many of the dogs we see now have no signalment. And mm -hmm. I think it has a lot of consequences for veterinary medicine. That's where we start. You know what breed a dog is and you know what diseases it's likely to have, and you go looking for that. Mm -hmm. What do we do about these mixed breed dogs? So there's definitely been discussion, and, and this is not going to be a, a near-term solution, unfortunately, but there has been discussion about this using genetics towards that personalized medicine, and how can it help? You know, so the idea of can you put in a genetic test that not only is going to tell you this mutt is this breed, this breed, and this breed, but also, you know, that, that whole profile of it is not only these breeds, but it's carrying certain markers that make it more or less susceptible for the diseases we know genetic markers are affiliated to. Um, but, you know, that is fantastic, and I think it's, I think I'm optimistic that at some point we're going to get our veterinary care, we're getting our human care is going to come down the same pathway. But we have to have the research to back up as new diseases come around or to look at diseases within different breeds. So there's a lot of times that you have a disease that might be very similar or, as far as you can tell, the same with the signs in different breeds, but yet it'll be a slightly different mutation. So when we do develop these genetic tests, it's why you see some tests very breed specific. But we have to look at, you know, I, I think the technology's there. It's like I was talking about the dairy cattle stuff. You know, in Ireland, they're coming up with tests where they say, yep, your animal is 100% Angus, so you can get the premium market for selling that animal. As well as, here are the carrier status or whatever status for all of these traits. So the technology's there. We need probably additional, it, you will always need the additional research as more and more diseases come up and we bring them to light genetically. But I think the possibility is there to have that as one of your veterinary tools. You're gonna send in a blood sample, a DNA sample. That will be extracted. It'll say this particular mutt is of these breeds and it has these particular genetic factors increasing or decreasing its risk. So I think the tools will be there down the line, but it's not a quick answer. And it's also one from an industry that you guys, veterinarians, consumers, have to be there saying, we want it and we will invest in it. Um, but we're also only gonna invest this much in it when it comes to how much will you pay 